This is a review of a book, and it's political. <laughs> uh, a former Danish parliament member for the Socialist Party, this dude, Pelle Traustel, has given us a vision for socialism in the third millennia, and I'm totally sold. Uh, there's going to be a couple of points of criticism in the end of this uh, talk for me to just keep a little bit of self-respect. But beside that, I'm sorry to say, I'm just fanboying. It is bold, it sails past these established idiosyncrasies of socialism, it's uncompromising, and it's more than anything pragmatic. It's so real, so realistic, and has nothing to do with these utopias. And it's called Nordic Socialism. <laughs> an amazing name. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Nordic Socialism. Uh, it is as if Nordic Animism just found out he has a brother that he didn't know. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've always thought of myself as a socialist, but it, it was somewhat of a protest, protest vote, I think. I just took the radical choice because I believe in social justice, but also to kind of as a general display of disgust uh, towards the corruption, dishonesty, power abuse and bigotry of all the other politicians. Um, and keeping in mind that this stuff, uh, Drauster's uh, vision still has a problem that it doesn't challenge modernity. Basically, he's not following my channel. Um, keeping that in mind and looking exclusively at uh, economic politics, then reading this stuff was like coming home. I realize, you know, that now I also have an economic policy, uh, politics that I can really believe in. But I almost feel actually that the, the word socialism is a bit of a problem here because it might push off people who totally shouldn't be pushed off. Um, this is not about cancelling the market or fantasizing about some utopian revolution or certainly not about some overgrown uh, grotesque bureauc bureaucracy, uh, you know, state bureaucracy, something like that. And definitely not about uh, dissolving ownership. It's about you owning what you make. Uh, and what, what uh, Trauster does, or the way he, he makes this happen, will seem familiar to the followers of this channel. He reflects on parts of our history, and, um, and, and the vision that he presents is very specifically Nordic, but it's not about fantasy, because in the way that it's not about fantasizing about distant peoples in some imaginary post-revolutionary scion, it's about reflecting on our own, own culture and what works in it. But this Nordic is not cultural essentialism, it's actually a transatlantic Nordic in a way. It's a bit like Santeria is an African culture, but it's also American. Nordic socialism is simultaneously very rooted in Nordic cultural history um, and something that emerges very much in uh, a transatlantic dialogue between Nordic, British, South European and particularly and importantly American voices. Right? So Trauste ha has made this coinage Nordic socialism with uh, inspiration from guess who? Donald Trump. Right? The American right wing and the American left wing has realized something that Scandinavians haven't realized, before now that is, and that is that there's a thing, Nordic Socialism, and it really works. This scares the living shit out of the, out of the right wingers, that some of the best functioning and most economically affluent societies in the world have considerable parts of their system which are socialist, and it's very, very inspiring to American left wingers. Uh, Nordic Socialism is the, in a sense, it's the Danish cooperative movement uh, 150 years of farmer tradition in close and intense dialogue with people like Bernie Sanders and Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez. You know, Trauster has a foundational and imminently convincing criticism of how we all perceive capitalism. We perceive it as monolithic, an all-encompassing thing, and both capitalists and socialists uh, have this idea. Capitalism is a functionalist, total systemic unity, and there's nothing outside it, nothing that we know of, because it's so all, almost cosmically absolute, right? But here's the thing, that's not how the world works. It just isn't. The real world is complex interplays between unaligned, often opposing, competing models, interests, dynamisms, and so on. There is no total systemic, coherent unities such as socialists and capitalists uh, alike have imagined uh, capitalism. 
And I feel like a little schoolgirl that I even need him to tell me this because in social and cultural scholarship, this is the only possible way of looking at the world today. This absolute image of capitalism as this all-exclusive thing, all-defining thing is just incorrect, full stop. It's like walking into a genetic laboratory and preaching intelligent design. A social context is not an organism where everything is defined by a whole. It, it's more like a biotope, like uh, uh, an ecological context with lots of different beings in it, and circulations and competitions and struggles going on, right? Cool. So, so this uh, monolithic idea has made socialists misunderstand and therefore mishandle how the world actually works. Um, first, we've overlooked our victories. And this is a point that Trauste uh, also takes from these American socialist writers, um, believing believing that we live inside this absolute all-encompassing fallen capitalism, we're unable to count our victories, right? We can't realize those situations where socialism has been implemented and has actually really worked because we ascribe socialism to some almost apocalyptic distant future uh, that, by the way, doesn't align at all with those dictatorial communist states that we're struggling to gloss over us or, or explain away and so on. So this absolutist, monolithic perspective makes us overlook the cases where it has been implemented and where it works really, really well. Um, so in order to describe when shit has worked, Trauster focuses on two things. Uh, he focuses on the oligarchic tendencies that capitalism tend to produce, which compromises democracy. You know, insane overconcentration of value in grotesquely powerful oligarchs. And the, the way we counter it is by focusing on ownership, democratic ownership. And this is important because it's a cornerstone in Nordic Socialism. This is not about some um, giant state taking your stuff and sucking it into some huge, corrupt, dysfunctional bureaucracy. It's actually the opposite. And this is why I think that when this sink in, Boy, Americans, for instance, I think they're gonna buy this. You know, it's about when you make something, you own it. Not some Wall Street gangster, you know, but also not some Soviet bureaucrat. You own the stuff you make, and we have historically already made this happen in defiance and resistance to of, of the oligarchy. So Trausta is looking for models to take ownership in defiance, not of capitalism as such as this all-encompassing thing, but of the oligarchy that capitalism tends to produce, parts of capitalism tends to produce. Now, through cultural history, people have resisted oligarchy, um, and, and, so, and they have resisted it in places that socialists have idiosyncratically tended to overlook a little bit, uh, in, in ways uh, it, that, that, that can counter the innate tendency of capitalism to produce oligarchy. Um, and this is not a utopia, it's very concrete, real ways that ha have worked, worked and still works. You know, Danish peasants have made co-ops for 150 years, but today there's democratic ownership in many places throughout s society, in all the Nordic countries and in other countries as well. People have taken democratic ownership over the stuff they made in opposition to capitalist oligarchy because they don't want to make stuff and have it owned by some capitalist Wall Street gangster, right? At one point uh, of uh, Danish history, 25% of all the economy was co-op. At one point in Danish history, the financial sector, banking, was 60%, more than half, co-op. A considerable part of the entire Denmark was socialist. And this has been an element uh, that has vitally contributed to producing a comparatively very powerful democratic state throughout Scandinavia. In international ra ratings for best country that focuses on happiness, believe in the future, confidence between people, you know, uh, also good for business, livable cities and so on, the Scandinavian countries they, they uh, dominate the top 10 ratings, and usually the four or five Scandinavian country, uh, countries are in the top five of these ratings. These are countries that are so economically affluent that uh, we're some of the richest places on the planet, while we have free access to universal health care and uh, free access to universal Ivy League level education. 
part of the reason behind this is Nordic Socialism. Right, so back to uh, capitalism. If capitalism is this all-defining absolutist whole <coughs> that socialists have used to, used to believe, then socialists are left with two cho choices. One choice is giving up. That's what so social democrats in uh, Denmark and other Scandinavian countries do. Um, that uh, strategy doesn't work because it doesn't take up the struggle against oligarchy. oligarchy basically just surrenders. Danish social democrats have sold off parts of the property of the, the whole country to oligarchic investment gangsters and stuff like that. That's one model. Model number two is imagining an alternative to capitalism. That's what revolutionary socialists do. Revolutionary socialism also uh, misunderstands the world. And again, I'm sitting here 45 years old, lived in, I've lived and worked in four countries and uh, four continents and eight countries and I have a PhD behind me and I'm feeling like a little school girl when Faust uh, explains this to me. Revolution, you know, who are going to buy it? The socialist revolution does, doesn't have any success stories. You know? And socialists have been busy defending this and explaining away, oh, if Trotsky had only become the president of the Soviet Union and, and Cuba had not met sanctions, then it would have been socialist scion. You know? Should have, would have, could have. If you're a revolutionary socialist, <clears throat> then understand this. Well, you might be right, and you, as opposed to generations of super competent Chinese, Russian, East European, different African, different South American socialists, that you have the ability to create socialist science. Cool, let's say you have that ability. Nobody's going to buy it, ever. Nobody's going no, nobody's to believe you. That socialist revolution, an idea that only ever succeeded in creating shite dictatorships, that that is going to be scion when you handle it. And for very, very good reasons that nobody will buy it. Because we live today in a hyper-complex society. And it is self-evident that a monolithic, absolute shift between absolutic model, absolutist models, capitalism as an all-encompassing model, and socialism as an all-encompassing future model, that that shift is going to be extremely precarious and dangerous in a hyper-complex society. It goes without saying just because of the complexity. High complexity mean, means high vulnerability when it comes to changing everything in an absolutist revolution between monolith monolithic systems. The only people who are ever going to buy this are people who are in such dystopian state of despair that they have absolutely no other choice. People whose situation is so bad that it cannot get worse. And that's not the people that we're talking to. You know, and part of the reason, paradoxically, that things are not all that bad is that socialism has already been Im impacting the world, right? So revolution is a fantasy. It's a fucking role-playing game. It's an apocalyptic religiosity. So grow up, get real, and get busy taking the power back. Nordic socialism has the tools. The cooperative movements work. Foundation socialism works. They, they, they used this model, for instance, in Alaska. They managed to reduce poverty in Alaska by 20% by, uh, by a foundation socialist model. That's a real achievement, right? Different kinds of common ownership works. And Klausler, he lines up the whole thing. The only thing that needs to happen is that left-wingers need to get their head out of their arses and start taking the power back. Uh, there are several perfectly good tools to make societies where people own the stuff they make and avoid capitalist oligarchy undermining democracy. Because socialists ha uh, have been either giving up the struggle or becoming and becoming social democrats or moving into Hogwarts land and becoming uh, revolutionaries, you know. And, but the ways of building and reproducing democratic uh, ownership ha have not been defended properly for that reason. They have not been developed with spirit and expanded properly, which is of course what we should start doing. In fact, neo neoliberalism has successfully created this misconception that capitalism is the end of history, the goal of humanity. Uh, uh, and, and, and so in the last 40 years in Scandinavia, co-ops have been privatized, property of the people has been sold off to international cartels of capitalist gangsters, working people's rights have been rolled back, oligarchs have had increasing success in pressuring democratic governments, um, and, uh, and people started believing that democratic ownership wasn't, wasn't anachronism. And in the face of this, Trauster's solution is visionary, it's boldly progressive, progressive. 
And yet I'm even tempted to use the word traditionalism <laughs> because he really bases himself on tested functioning models from history. And he acknowledges and bases himself on complexity rather than the totalitarian monolithic ideas. And this, by the way, is part of the reason that this shit is going to work. It takes as its starting point the real lived complexity, not imagined um, totalities. In my uh, last review uh, on the uh, uh, Australian Aboriginal complexity theorist um, Tyson Juncker-Porter, who thinks with social complexity in communities as the uh, only uh, way that real uh, solutions uh, can emerge, um, you know, and this is that, you know, Trausted envisions uh, working with many different models and develop different models in the different relevant parts of society. We don't need to cancel the market. Also, we don't need to attack private initiative. And people get, making good model, money can go on doing that. What we need to do is start building what he calls a pluralist architecture of democratic ownership. Uh, this is not you know, capitalism or socialism is not a have your pie and eat it model. We can have the advantage, or some of the advantages of the capitalist market and we can rid our communities of these oligarchs who behave like some dystopian sci-fi warlords, right? And that is Nordic socialism. Right, so here are my criticisms. Uh, we don't have the time. If this had been implemented and become a huge movement 40 years ago, then yeah, uh, we could have saved the world, but now, it's unfortunately, it's too late. We're heading for climate apocalypse. Uh, and though this model does address this problem as one of the main issues, uh, it doesn't include the fact that it's happening at a speed uh, that's much faster uh, than this can actually uh, be implemented. <laughs> uh, that's problem number one. Perhaps related problem, socialism is modernist. And uh, Trauster's uh, socialism is still modernist. It does not include the, uh, our contemporary um, access to indigenous thinking, uh, to uh, non-Eurocentric models for understanding the world. It, it, it's, an, it's an awesome model, I think, for, for how to handle uh, economy, but uh, the experience of the world as dead rather than alive as the foundation for the uh, global destruction and on the side is not taken into account. And uh, this is basically because, <laughs> this is basically the reason that uh, it would be important to cobble Nordic uh, socialism with Nordic animism. And of course, when uh, Nordic socialism becomes a global model and spreads into Southern Europe and South America and so on, then uh, of course uh, other kinds of animisms that can, uh, that can um, address uh, uh, traditional, uh, traditional knowledge forms and bring into uh, play traditional ways of land connectedness and uh, knowledge of the world, the patterns of reality and the world as uh, living communities of beings and not this dead exterior pile of Lego bricks that it's just for humanity to exploit as efficiently as possible. Anyway, thanks for listening.